Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, I'd like to inform all participants that today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. All participants will remain on a listen-only mode for the duration of the call until the question and answer session. At that time, if you would like to ask a question, you may do so by pressing star and one. I would now like to turn the call over to Linda Lee. You may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Linda Lee, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2017 Economic Census Data Webinar on the mining, construction, and manufacturing sectors. Today's webinar is being recorded. A copy of the recording slides and transcript will be available to you on our website, found under the Census Academy within five to 10 business days. At the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. And in addition to this, we also have a chat feature available for you. So for today's webinar, I will begin with the first half of the presentation, where we will take a look at the information related to the mining, construction, and manufacturing sectors. Then I will turn over the presentation to my colleague, Mr. Andy Haight, who will be taking a dive into the data from these sectors. So let's go into the structure of the 2017 Economic Census webinar series. We began the series back in February, highlighting our ongoing releases of data from the 2017 Economic Census. The series contained 20 webinars and are presented in two formats. One format are webinars on the recently released data by geography. These are the ones listed in the left column. In these webinars, you are able to learn about highlights of data and changes uh, that, have been impacted, that have impacted the data by selected states. And as you'll notice, the webinars highlighted in gray have been completed with the last one for the state-based webinars at the end of July. And if you're interested in viewing our past webinars, the link at the bottom of the slide leads you directly to the Census Academy, where we have these webinars archived. The other format, which you will see here today, concentrates on the recently released economic census data by sector, as classified by the North American Industry Classification System, also commonly referred to as the NAICS. Today's webinar on mining, construction, and manufacturing are classified under NAICS code 21, 23, and 31 through 33, respectively. And before we move along, I want to mention that if you've seen our first look report released at the national level back in September of 2019, the data are superseded by these later reports. Let's take a look at a high-level overview about the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau conducts over 130 surveys each year, with our highly recognizable ones listed on this slide. The decennial census takes place every 10 years, and we are currently conducting the decennial. We highly encourage you to spread the word to anyone who may not have had the opportunity to participate yet. It's quick and easy, it's safe and secure, and it's not too late. Responses to the decennial help funding flow into your states and communities each year. Another one of our highly visible programs is the American Community Survey. This is an annual program that collects demographic data, so you're able to find out statistics on households from the ACS. We also have the Census of Government, which is the public counterpart of the program that we will be looking at today, the Economic Census. Both of these programs are conducted every five years in the years ending in two and seven. The graphic that you see on the right is our census.gov main page. This is the place to begin when, you're, when you want to explore all possibilities and offerings that we have at the Census Bureau. And I'd like to also point out that we have a new feature on the main page, which is the COVID-19 Data Hub. This is your one-stop shop for data as it relates to the coronavirus and its impact on businesses and the community. If you haven't had the chance to see the data hub, I think that you'll find the wealth of data and information that we have on this topic is quite impressive. This slide shows the relationship between the data release frequency and the level of detail. When you are looking for data, we have data released by different frequencies. The relationship between frequency and detail are best exemplified by this pyramid, where surveys that are released more frequently provide less detail. Now, with that being said, the economic census is located at the bottom of the pyramid because it is our most comprehensive source for business data. So let's dive into the economic census. As our most comprehensive business program, the economic census collects data at the two through six digit level NAICS code with some exceptions. For instance, NAICS code 11 for agriculture is excluded. 
From the Census Bureau, limited data is available on NAICS 11 from our programs called the County Business Patterns and the Non-Employer Statistics. The CDP and NES can provide the number of establishments, annual payroll, and number of employees for NAICS 11. Now, apart from these variables, your primary source of data for this sector is available from the USDA. And a full list of exclusions is available for you at this link. Another defining feature of the economic census is the level of geography. Now, while we do have other programs such as the county business patterns and the zip code business patterns available, because these programs are conducted more frequently, they provide less detail. From the economic census, you can obtain over 200 data variables at the granular level. It covers almost 8 million employer businesses, excluding non-employers. Um, which are insignificant in some industries um, in this sector, but not in others. The economic census also include product lines data. Now, this is not an industry of origin base. It is a comprehensive market or demand-based classification system for goods and services. And it's neat because it can be linked to the next industry structure. So where can you access our data? Well, a primary way is to go to data.census.gov, where you can perform a search similar to the way you would on a standard search engine. And the data is also available on the Census Business Builder and other census tools. So what's next in the release of the data for the 2017 Economic Census? Well, right now, we have just completed the release of the Geographic Area Statistics phase on August the 20th. This is much earlier than we had anticipated. And beginning in November of this year, the product statistics will begin to release. The establishment and firm size statistics also begin releasing in November of this year, well into September 2021. And miscellaneous statistics will be available during this time frame as well. Now, this schedule is available on our site, and a link is provided here for you as well. It's definitely worth checking this schedule out now and then, especially if you're waiting for a particular data release, because we may update the schedule to earlier release dates. And if you're interested in seeing the full list, please use this link. Or you can also find the schedule under the Economic Census section on our site, census.gov. And here are some geographic area statistics resources for you. The link in the red border takes you to a page where you can obtain information on what's been released as well as upcoming releases. You'll also see this handy interactive map on the page. The fully filled hexagons indicate that the data for the sector that you selected have been released for that state. And if you look at the lower right-hand corner, the donut-shaped graph tells you the percentage of data that have been released. Now, even though the series is now completed, uh, with all the data by geography released, this visualization is still useful as it provides deep links into the data.census.gov to the data by state and sector. You can also use the menus to drill down by geography and by industry. This slide provides an overview of the type of businesses that are categorized in the mining, construction, and manufacturing sectors. It's good to know that the economic census is collected on an establishment level. So what this means is that sometimes a single business address for these sectors can translate to two or more establishments. For instance, the research and development facility can be at the manufacturing plant. So therefore, the establishment will receive two forms. When you're looking at the data for the mining sector found under the NAICS Code 21, these are establishments that operate a mine and or provide mining support activities. And these establishments are grouped according to the natural resource that are being mined. The construction sector are establishments that are primarily engaged in construction of buildings and also engineering projects such as highways and utility systems. Construction work can include a wide range from new projects to additions and alterations to maintenance and repair. When you're using data from this sector, it's important to know that you may want to consider including data from our program called the Non-Employer Statistics. This is because many establishments in the construction sector are non-employers, where they do not report an employee. Non-employer statistics can be a critical component to consider in some industries while they're less likely to occur in other industries. And finally, the manufacturing sector are establishments that transform materials into new products. 
Manufacturing establishments also include some activities like publishing or retail bakeries that are not immediately thought of as manufacturing. One thing you may want to take note is that shipment values for both mining and manufacturing sectors represent the fair market value of the product when it leaves the plant, not the sales value. And that's because these products are often shipped to establishments owned by the same company. So we ask them to put a fair value on the product. Let's take a look at the graph for a moment. This graph shows the number of establishments for different sectors of the economy. Represented in red are the mining, construction, and manufacturing sectors. As you can see, there are 715, 364,000 numbers of establishments nationwide operating in the construction sector of the economy. You'll also notice that while retail trade is leading the pack in the number of establishments for all sectors, the number of establishments for the construction sector is not too far behind. At the bottom of the slide, you'll notice several key facts for the mining, construction, and manufacturing sectors. While the construction sector has more number of establishments when compared to the manufacturing sector, here we see that for the employment aspect, more people are employed in the manufacturing sector. And a side note on employment data from the economic census, the data are not adjusted to full-time employment and reflect the pay period including March 12. So they are affected by seasonality. And if you'd like more information on this, please check out the quarterly census of employment and wages available at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You'll also notice that the manufacturing sector leads the way when it comes to the value of shipment and revenue reporting approximately 5.5 trillion in 2017. So if you're a data user who may have been using data from the first look report that was released at the national level back in September of last year, you should update your files because the geographic area statistics supersede the first look data. For our regular users of the economic census data, please take note of this slide. As there are key changes in the release of the 2017 data. First, we have geographic area changes, counties, place, places, uh, metropolitan statistical areas have been redefined. There are also changes to the NAICS with the addition of new codes while other codes have changed. And I'll go more into this on the next slide. The 2017 economic census includes the North American Product Classification System, also referred to as the NAP. Now this replaces the old product lines table from the previous releases. The new NAP system makes it easier for you to look at data for the end product. Before the NAP, if you were interested in finding data for a particular product, you would have to find data for all sectors that contributed to the existence of that product or services such as manufacture, wholesale, and retail sectors. And the data may not be consistent with one another as they could have different methodologies. So the NAPS is a welcome addition for anyone who regularly uses our product's data. Other changes include the way miscellaneous subjects data are released. And you'll recall from a few slides back, the miscellaneous statistics will begin releasing in November. Another key update is our new disclosure rule. So previously, we were able to publish the number of establishments if the remainder of the data are subject to disclosure. Under our new rule, we are unable to provide information on disclosed establishments. And finally, the economic census is disseminated on our new platform accessible at data.census.gov. And as of August, um, it is now on the Census Business Builder. If you need more information on these key changes, please use the link and you'll be able to view a webinar that details all the changes. One of the updates I mentioned on the previous slide is the NAICS. The NAICS system was adopted in 1997 and updated every five years to coincide with the economic census years. The 2017 manual is hyperlinked here for easy access and it's also available on our site census.gov. So let's take a look specifically at the types of NAICS changes for this release. We have changes categorized as one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-one, and many-to-many -many type of updates. Here are some illustrations on the type of code updates. 
Highlighted in green are examples of many to one where many codes from the previous edition are consolidated under one code in 2017. In this example, we see that in the mining sector, copper, nickel, lead, and zinc mining is now one code in the 2017 edition. And similarly, for the manufacturing sector, we see several codes consolidated as well. For the construction sector, there were no changes, so you'll be able to do a comparison between the 2012 and 2017 economic census years. In blue is an example of one-to-one, -one, where the code itself changed with the classification description itself remaining constant. And on this slide, the peach highlight for the professional scientific and technical services shows an example of one to many. This is often the case of an increase in economic activity surrounding the business activity, therefore warranting a breakout of the code in order to measure the emerging industry. All the great data you've seen today is available to you on several tools. Quick Facts, just as the name suggests, is a tool where you can quickly obtain statistics for all states, counties, cities, and towns with a population of 5,000 or more. You can also obtain the 2017 economic census data on the Census Business Builder, also commonly referred to as the CBB. Our latest version of this tool, version 3.1, just came out back in August, includes the 2017 economic census data. And for anyone who has not had the chance to use the CBD, it is a user-friendly tool with two editions available based on your needs. The edition that is right for you depends on if your um, data need is for a single industry or for all business sectors at the same time. And you're in luck today. My colleague, Andy, who is up next, is the project manager for this tool. So you, if you have questions on this tool, he will be able to go more thoroughly and provide you a response. Finally, data.census.gov is a new data dissemination platform. The search experience on this platform is similar to those typical of your search engines. And we also have an advanced search feature, so you can drill down to the specifics that way as well. We have fun facts available for you on all 50 states. Each of the fun facts include a picture of the state's quarter along with data for a specific sector within that particular state. On this slide, we see that in 2017, there are 150 establishments in the mining sector with 10,922 employees reporting a total shipment of 12.3 billion. Similar type of data is seen for the construction sector for Montana and the manufacturing sector in Alabama. But these are only a handful of fun facts for the mining, construction, and manufacturing sectors. We have more fun facts on these sectors from other states, such as Maine, Maryland, New Hampshire, Oregon, South Carolina, Utah, and West Virginia. And the first link on this page will lead you directly to our economic census visualization where you can obtain these graphics. If you haven't already subscribed to us, I highly encourage you to do so. Not only will you receive these type of fun facts, but you'll also be receiving notifications on our upcoming new data releases and events. You'll also be able to receive messages for our America Counts platform where we feature stories behind the data. If you've not had the chance to visit the America Counts page, the second link on this slide will take you to an America Counts story. And this particular story is about the interactive map that you saw earlier in one of the earlier slides. And now I would like to turn over the presentation to my colleague, Mr. Andy Haight, who will be diving into data from the mining, construction, and manufacturing sector. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, so again, my name is Andy Haight. Um, let me go ahead and get myself signed in over here and connected so you can actually see my presentation. Um, I am an economist uh, at the U.S. Census Bureau. I've worked at the Bureau for a little over 30 years, uh, and I've spent my entire career working in what we call our economic directorate. Uh, that is the part of the Census Bureau that is responsible for all of those great business surveys that Linda was talking about in her presentation. Um, so what I'm going to be doing today uh, is talk a little bit about some of the data findings uh, that we had for these three sectors uh, from the 2017 economic census. 
So to get us started, uh, the, the graph you see here is looking at the mining, construction, and manufacturing sector broken out by three-digit NAICS subsectors. Uh, that is, subsector is a term that we use to refer to a three-digit NAICS code. And as you can see, uh, the mining sector is the smallest of these three sectors. Uh, when I pulled this data, I was interested to see that in all three of these subsectors within mining, when we look at the change between 2012 and 2017 in terms of shipments or revenue, all three sectors have seen a decline between 2012 and 2017. Oil and gas extraction is, as you can see, the largest of the three subsectors, but it is also the, sec the, sec the uh, subsector that had the most decline between 2012 and 2017. The mining sector, except oil and gas extraction, also saw a decline, but its decline was the least. And this does bring up a very important point about comparability of our data over time whenever you're talking about dollar-related variables. So for things like number of establishments or employment, um, number of production workers, data that are numbers, comparing data over time is fairly easy. When you're looking at total employment in an industry and you want to see how that employment changed, there's no adjustment that you need to make when you compare data between 2012 and 2017. But that is not true when you are using our revenue, shipments, receipts, and other types of statistics that are expressed in terms of dollars. When we conduct the economic census, we do not adjust these data for inflation. So when you're comparing data over time, very often you need to keep into account price change and inflation, or in some cases deflation, um, when you're looking at that comparison. So some of the large decline in the oil and gas extraction industry between 2012 and 2017 that we can see on this chart may be due to price change. The, if the price per gallon of a barrel of oil declined between 2012 and 2017, even when businesses were still producing as much oil and gas as they were before, if the price decreased, then you would expect to see a decline in the total shipments. That does mean that when you're looking at our data, number one, you need to think about that in terms of that adjustment, but also in some of our business data programs, including the data for mining and manufacturing, we not only publish dollars, but we publish quantities. And that sometimes is a great resource to be able to understand change over time, because quantities, tons or tons, you don't need to adjust them. Now, in looking at the construction sector, you can see that there are two subsectors that really had the biggest growth uh, between 2012 and 2017. The first is the construction of buildings sector. That includes businesses who build residential homes, as well as businesses that build commercial, industrial, and institutional businesses, uh, buildings, as well as specialty trade contractors, which is the industry or the subsector that would include companies, uh, businesses that are electricians or plumbers or drywall contractors or terrazzo contractors, et cetera. Those two subsectors are the largest subsectors within this particular um, industry or this particular sector, um, and you can see that they've also seen the most growth. Um, in fact, construction of businesses saw the largest of those three subsectors. Now, when we look at the manufacturing sector, we see a lot of subsector codes. In fact, in the NAICS classification system, manufacturing is the sector that has the most three-digit NAICS codes that break out that detail. So you can see there are detailed specific subsectors for food manufacturing, uh, petroleum and coal product manufacturing, et cetera. Uh, this is one of the most detailed industry products that we, that we publish. As you can clearly see, the transportation equipment manufacturing uh, subsector was the one that had the largest increase between 2012 and 2017. And in just a moment, I'm going to be exploring this transportation equipment uh, sector a little, or subsector a little bit more, just to give you a flavor for the types of detailed data that are available in the economic census. Right now, we're looking at three-digit 
industries at the national level. If we wanted to then see, well, what are the states that have seen the biggest increase in their transportation equipment manufacturing businesses, we can go ahead and do that as well. Now, before I get off the slide, I want to reiterate one thing that Linda said in her part of the presentation, and that is that in the economic census, we exclude non-employer businesses, self-employed people, from the definition of, from the, from the coverage of the economic census. And when we think about these three sectors, self-employed people are certainly possible in the manufacturing and mining sectors, but it's hard to sort of imagine them being numerous or them being substantial in terms of their impact in the industry. Um, expect, you know, a very small paper manufacturer could be a self-employed person that makes paper in their garage. Uh, but again, the impact on the paper manufacturing industry is probably very small due to these non-employers. That fact is definitely not true when we think about the construction sector. When we're looking at construction of buildings, and certainly when we're looking at specialty trade contractors, you need to remember that these statistics from the economic census only include employer plumbers only include employer electricians. These are businesses with one or more paid employees that file the payroll tax form with the IRS. There are hundreds of thousands of independent electricians and plumbers and a variety of other types of specialty trade contractors. So I always advise people whenever you're using data from the economic census, first, be aware of the prevalence of self-employed people in that industry. In some industries, you can ignore them. They, they are not very numerous, and they don't make up much of a difference in the particular industry. But in other industries, I really encourage folks to add together the, the data from the economic census to the data from non-employer statistics to allow you to understand the complete package, the complete industry. So specialty trade contractors, very, very true there. Now on this next slide uh, that I'm going to get to, let's change gears and talk a little bit about employment. Um, how has the change in employment matched where, you know, in com comparison to shipments? And we can see in comparison to the previous slide where specialty trade contractors certainly increased but not as much as building construction contractors, that is not true when it comes to employment um, data itself. Specialty trade contractors are the largest um, employer in the construction sector, and that particular subsector also saw the largest increase in employees. One of the attendees did just I noticed, po uh, post a note in, there in the chat about where can I get this data on non-employers. We have a specific survey called Non-Employer Statistics. It is available on the Census Bureau's website. If you search for it on that site, you'll find it. It is also available in our brand new data.census.gov data tool, our platform. And we have also merged together the employer and the non-employer data in the Census Business Builder tool that Linda um, talked to you all about. So if you wanted to get information on how many electricians there are in the United States and you wanted to add together the number of employers and the number of non-employers, We've done that for you in Census Business Builder. Now, when we look at the employment in the manufacturing sector, we can see that the largest subsector in terms of employment is actually food manufacturing. On the previous slide, we could see that transportation equipment manufacturing was the largest sector in terms of revenue, but that's not true when it comes to um, employment. It's actually just slightly ahead of. Now, in comparison, transportation equipment manufacturers still is a very large employer, and it actually had the largest increase, um, going from about 1.4 million employees in 2012 to about 1.5 million employees in 2017. I know that many of us sort of have heard the common story or common wisdom that manufacturing is in decline in the United States. That may be true in some industries, but it is certainly not true in others, and that is definitely not the case when it comes to transportation equipment manufacturing. So this is looking at employment in comparison to the revenue data that we saw on the previous slide. 
Now let's look a little bit about how much do these workers, on average, get paid. In the economic census, we publish statistics on total annual payroll, and we publish statistics on total employment, and any reasonably savvy data user uh, can take those two, two statistics and create a ratio that looks at the average annual payroll per employee. That's what I've done here on this slide. So this is now looking at the data by subsector, just like the previous uh, two slides. And as we can see, the picture looks a little different. In the, in the construction sector, while specialty trade contractors were the most at, in terms of employment and were one of the highest in terms of revenue, if you work in heavy and civil engineering construction, that's the industry, that's the subsector to work in in terms of the highest average annual payroll. Those workers in that particular subsector earn on average about $71,000 a year. The picture looks even more different when you look at manufacturing. On the previous slide, we could see that food product manufacturing and transportation equipment manufacturing tend to be or are the two subsectors that had the highest amount of employees in 2012 and 2017. But in terms of how much those workers earn, it is good to work for a petroleum or cold product manufacturer because those workers, on average, earn about $104,000 per year. Um, again, these numbers are not adjusted for inflation, so if you wanted to compare average annual payroll per employment for each of these subsectors over time, you would just have to keep in mind that the data are not adjusted, and there's a certain amount of price change um, that goes there. Now, You'll notice uh, that in this industry, there are very few manufacturing industries that actually have an average annual payroll per employment that's lower than the national average for every single NAICS code. On average, when you look at every single type of business in the United States that are covered by the economic census, the average for what we call NAICS 00, zero the total, is about $52,000 a year. And you can see there are some industries that are below there, but there's also a lot of industries in manufacturing that are pretty substantially above there, including, of course, petroleum and coal product manufacturing. Now, as I mentioned, the economic census publishes data not only at the national level, but it also publishes data by state. And I'm sort of a curious data user, so I was really sort of curious to look at uh, those shipment statistics that we were seeing for transportation uh, equipment manufacturers to see is that increase in transportation equipment manufacturers even across the nation or are there some states where that shipment increase has grown more than others and are there some states that dominate more than others? So I went into our data.census.gov platform and I actually pulled the shipment statistics for transportation equipment manufacturers by state and as we can see, uh, clearly see Michigan leads the nation in terms of the total shipments of transportation equipment manufacturers. About 121 billion, excuse me, thousand million, yes, billion dollars. These statistics are shown in thousands. So it's 121 billion, 259 million, 602 thousand dollars. Right behind Michigan was Indiana. That was a little bit of a surprise to me, uh, but when I've been working on a brand new story on the RV industry, I know that almost all of the RV manufacturers are actually based in Indiana, and so it would be really interesting to drill down within this transportation equipment manufacturing subsector to see what types of transportation equipment manufacturers are seeing the biggest share of this, of this shipment amount in Indiana. Um, so again, I'm really encouraging you all to kind of further explore these data because there's really sort of quite fascinating things in there. The third ranked state in terms of transportation equipment manufacturers by state is Ohio with about $76 billion. And then right behind there is Texas with about $70 billion and Washington State with $62 billion. Now, when you think about Washington State, Think about the types of transportation equipment manufacturers that are physically located in, in, in Washington State. Are these automobile manufacturers or are these aircraft manufacturers? The economic census provides data not only at the two-digit 
and the three-digit subsector, but also down to the four, five, and six-digit detailed NAICS codes. So we could further drill down within this state-level breakout to look at how each of these subsectors is distributed across all the industries, and is the mix of transportation equipment manufacturers in Michigan the same as it is in Washington? The short answer is no, it is not. But this is the kind of statistics that are available. In the previous couple of slides, I did do a comparison between 2012 and 2017. In this particular slide, I cheated a little and just showed you all the 2017 data. But again, I would really encourage you all to kind of explore this further, to download the data for 2012 and 2017 to see, is Michigan not only the biggest state in terms of transportation equipment manufacturers, but has it also grown the most? Or are there other states, like Alabama, or South Carolina, or Kentucky, or California, that have added a lot of transportation manufacturers, um, startups in those couple of states in the last few years, Tennessee. It would be really interesting to compare that. Now, again, thinking more about these transportation equipment manufacturers, I was sort of curious to see, is the average annual payroll per employee for people who work for these transportation equipment manufacturers the same across all states, or does it vary widely? As you can see in the chart, it most definitely varies widely. The state that offers the highest average annual payroll per employment in this particular subsector is actually the state of Colorado at about $104,000 per employee. Right behind there is the state of Arizona, then Washington, then Connecticut, which is sort of interesting, and then finally the state of Texas at about $77,000. So if I was graduating um, from college and I was interested in working as a, as a manager, let's say a, a plant foreman for a transportation equipment manufacturer, I might be interested in looking at jobs in one of these states because they tend to pay higher. Now, some of the reason why they may pay higher is because the mixture of businesses within the transportation equipment manufacturers might be different. The types of transportation equipment manufacturers in Colorado might be very different than those that are actually located in Michigan, which pays more like around $60,000 per year. So certainly you would want to look at those. And as one of our attendees uh, just posted, um, Yes, you would certainly also want to look at the cost of living in those particular areas. If you're working in the transportation equipment manufacturing industry in Tennessee and you're earning fifty-six or so thousand dollars a year working for that business, but your cost of living is half what it would be in in Colorado or in California, let's say, maybe that money actually goes farther. So these data can be very valuable from a worker perspective. And certainly they are very valuable from a business perspective because it helps businesses understand what the market is of other businesses like them if they're thinking about expansion. So if I was looking to open a transportation equipment manufacturing business in a particular state in the nation and I wanted to find the one that pays the least, I might want to look at the economic census data to see what is that state. And as you can see, it's actually Wyoming. Now, to the point I was making earlier about how the mixture of businesses within a particular subsector could be quite different from state to state, I dove in a little bit into the shipments in the state of Michigan in transportation equipment manufacturing. I can see I have a little typo there on the word transportation. And no surprise to me, the two industry groups, the four-digit NAICS codes that actually constitute the largest share of manufacturing shipments in this particular subsector are motor vehicle manufacturers and motor vehicle parts manufacturers. While there certainly are some motor vehicle body, aerospace, ship and boat building, and other transportation equipment manufacturers, and even a little bit of railroad building stock manufacturers in the state of Michigan, this industry, this particular subsector, is really dominated by these two industry groups in this state. If we looked at this same industry group breakout, though, for another state, we might see a dramatically different breakout. That fourth category, aerospace product and parts manufacturing for Washington state, may look very different 
than this chart does here. So again, this is just giving us a taste of the data that is available. In these tables, I've downloaded data at the national and state level, but as Linda said, statistics in the economic census are available by metropolitan area, by county, and even by city and town, villages and boroughs, what we call an economic place. So if I really wanted to drill down within the state of Michigan to see what counties are growing more, what counties make up the vast majority of these motor vehicle manufacturers, what is the average payroll per employment in those counties, the data would be available. Now I do want to remind everybody, of course, um, that um, our data are all submitted to privacy protections. So there are certainly cases where we can show data at a more aggregated level, but not able to show it at the more detailed industry levels because you may only have a very small number of manufacturers, a small number of companies in that industry in that county. If you think about a particular county in Washington State, there may only be one company in a particular industry in that county. So while we can publish data on the state as a whole, when you get down to the individual counties, you often then find cases where the data have had to be suppressed. So I do just want to remind you all that we are uh, very committed to protecting the privacy of businesses who respond to the economic census. And because of that privacy protection, we do have to suppress data periodically when you could identify that. So as Linda said, we've just completed with the release of the mining, construction, and manufacturing data, the local area statistics, or what we call the geographic area statistics from the economic census. So you may be wondering, well, in that calendar that she showed you all, what's coming next? What are the next things that are coming out? So in November, we will be releasing something called the NAPS tables. That stands for North American Product Classification System. Now, as some of you probably know, in addition to publishing basic industry type statistics, we also publish something called product lines or product statistics as part of the economic census. In the past, those product statistics were published very differently between manufacturing, mining, and construction and between the services sectors. So what those product data looked like for a grocery store was very different. The tables looked very different than how the tables looked for grocery manufacturers in the manufacturing sector. For the very first time, we will be implementing this new North American product classification system or NAP system. And what the thing that it's going to be doing is it's going to standardize the dissemination of all of those product lines data across each industry. So if I was interested, for example, in looking at information on manufacturers of food products, wholesalers of food products, and retailers of food products, I will now be able to go to one table and pull those food product product lines data for across all three of those particular sectors in one place. Now, obviously, for today's webinar, we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about that. There will actually be a future webinar just on these new NAPS data. But, in, but before we actually do that, I would encourage you all to check out this link that I've provided here on the slide that's the understanding NAP. So it will give you sort of a, a preview of what these NAPS tables are going to look like. Now, after we release the NAPS tables, we will also start releasing what we call our establishment and firm size report. One of the most common requests that I get when I do presentations for users is, Andy, does Census Bureau have data on small business? And I always say, well, what do you mean by small? Is your definition of small based upon an individual establishment, or is it based upon a firm? Is your definition of small based upon how many employees they have? or is your definition small based upon what their revenue is? In the economic census, we publish all four of those dimensions in the establishment and firm size report. So if my definition of a small manufacturer was a manufacturing establishment that had less than 100 employees, those data are published in the establishment and firm size reports. Now, in addition to those business size tables, there are also some tables on things like concentration ratios, 
the how much the top four, eight, 20, and 50 largest companies in a firm make up of the total. The legal form of organization, are these companies corporations, are there partnerships, are they proprietorships, and even franchise status. And yes, in these three sectors that we've been talking about today, there are franchise industries within those three sectors. Fine manufacturers, I learned a couple of years ago, is an industry where there's actually franchise opportunities available in that particular industry, and that's in the manufacturing sector. So that, those reports will start coming out in November and will continue through September of next year. And while that's also happening, we'll be releasing something called the miscellaneous subjects tables. Uh, these are a eclectic mix of some very different specialized tables. And what I will say, uh, for those of you who are interested in the construction sector, these tables not only include statistics on construction businesses just in total, but they also publish data on what they call kind of business and type of construction. So when you think about some construction businesses, let's pick um, a particular construction industry like single family home builders. There are businesses in that industry that just build homes, but there are also businesses in the industry that in addition to building the home itself, also do the wiring in that home or also do the plumbing in that home. They don't subcontract out that work. They actually do that work themselves. So they have product lines, basically, in that industry that include activities that are outside of just simply building homes themselves. That type of kind of business and type of construction data is available. And you can see, in looking at those statistics, how very diversified some construction businesses are, where they have activities across a wide variety of products and industries, where other construction businesses tend to be very, very specialized. So those data will be coming out after there as well. So to summarize our presentation for today, and I want to thank you all uh, for sticking it out uh, with us for this last 50 minutes or so, uh, the economic census provides an amazing wealth of business data. This is our largest business survey that we do at the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, it produces the most detailed statistics that are available. They are not the most timely statistics that are available. We certainly have more timely data available in our economic indicator surveys, like the monthly shipments, inventories, and orders report that covers the manufacturing sector. But the economic census really excels in terms of the detailed data, the data broken out by industry, and by geography, those 200 or so data variables that are published. In the manufacturing sector, that sector actually publishes the most variables of any sector in the economic census. You can get detailed information not only on employment, payroll, and sales or shipments, but you can also get inventories and assets and depreciation and capital expenditures and purchase services and a wide variety of other statistics. Now, because the economic census is our largest program, it takes us a while to get it all out. We release these data on a slow basis. We just completed the release of all of our state and local area data in August, uh, but there's all those other programs that I was just talking about. So if you want to learn more, I would go ahead and recommend you check out these news updates and the releases calendar that are here as well. Now, I did just notice um, a particular uh, an attendee just asked a question uh, that I just saw pop up about does the economic census cover the U.S. territories? American Samoa, Guam, Northern Marianas, U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. And the short answer is no, the economic census doesn't, but the economic census of island areas does. We actually have a completely separate economic census of those five U.S. territories, so those data um, would be available from that program. Linda also made the point when she was talking about the geographies that are published in the economic census that the geographic breakout that is available by, um, by sector varies from sector to sector. So for example, if you're talking about the retail trade sector, data are published at the national, state, metro, county, and place levels, as well as a few other sort of more esoteric levels. If you're talking about the mining sector, the data are only published at the national and state level. 
we don't have data at those smaller levels of geography. And the single biggest reason for that, for why we actually publish some sectors down to some geographies and others down to less geographies, is privacy. There's only 26,000, or excuse me, 46,000 mining businesses in the United States. And if you start slicing and dicing those businesses down to geographies by industry, you would very likely end up with a lot of metropolitan areas and counties and certainly places that may only have one mining establishment in a particular industry in that particular county. In every one of those cases, we would have to suppress the data um, for those particular um, industries. Um, so we don't even bother even trying. So some sectors like retail, combination food services, um, we publish amazing breakout of geographic data, data. In other sectors, we publish a little bit less. Now one point that Linda also made when we're talking about the summary is that make changes every five years. When you are comparing data over time, please, please, please make sure that what you're comparing is comparable. We've got resources available on our next website that allow you to go in and look for those industry changes that, that Linda talked about. It lets you understand that if I was interested in looking at data for appliance manufacturers, the code that we published in 2012 for household appliance manufacturers is very different than the codes that we published in 2012 for household appliance manufacturers. So 17, we had one code. 2012, we had five codes. So if I wanted to compare that data over time, I'd want to take those five codes from 2012, add them up, and that would then give me a comparable number to compare to 2017. Data.census.gov is our new primary data dissemination tool. It is the main tool that the Economic Census is being released on. If you have not yet started to use data.census.gov, if you're still sort of bemoaning the loss of American Fact Finder, it's time to get over it because this is now here to stay, and I would really encourage you all to go in there and check it out. I will tell you, um, as someone who has grown up on American Fact Finder, I started working at the Census Bureau in 1987, way before AFF even existed, um, data.census.gov really has the promise of doing many things that you could never do in American Fact Finder. So we're not there yet, but we're certainly working there. And finally, to close this out, uh, there's more data coming. I gave you guys a preview of some of those other reports. I would encourage you all to keep checking back on the Economic Census website to see what's coming out. So with that, I want to say thank you uh, to you all for taking time um, to be able to attend this webinar. Um, and we would like to now open it up for questions. I know that we've take, been taking some um, in chat, uh, but we also can open up for you to ask them uh, via the phone. So operator, we're ready to take some questions. Absolutely. If you would like to ask a question, press star 1 from your phone, unmute your line, and record your first and last name clearly when prompted. If you would like to withdraw your question, you can press star 2. Just a moment as we wait for questions to queue. Hey Andy, this is Linda. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, we did receive a question in the chat um, about landscaping trade and um, and mowers. Where where um, does landscaping trade come in and mowers, etc.? I'm assuming this question is asking for how are they classified? Yeah. So landscaping contractors are actually not in any of the three sectors that we have talked about today. Uh, landscaping contractors, um, which would include people who just go around their neighborhoods and mow lawns, um, are actually classified in NAICS 81, uh, which is other services. It, that is a very eclectic mix of businesses, uh, but they are not actually considered uh, mining establishments, construction establishments, or manufacturers. Now, certainly in manufacturing, the companies that make the mowers, those are in the manufacturing data. The construction businesses that use those mowers in doing their work, they, they are in the construction sector. But no, the landscapers themselves are, in, are not in any of these three sectors. Now, I did, um, while we're waiting, operator, for uh, questions to come in, there was one question that came in while 
um, while Linda was presenting, talking about NAFTA um, and asking about what type of data do we have that can show potentially show the impacts of the North American Free Trade Agreement and the new version of NAFTA um, on business? Um, and I'll answer that question in sort of two parts. First is the fact that NAICS, the North American Industry Classification System, is a three-country agreement. At the two through five-digit NAICS code levels, the U.S. Canada and Mexico all use the exact same code system. So if I wanted to compare manufacturing data in, ma in the United States to manufacturing data in Canada and Mexico, and I wanted to drill down from the two-digit NAICS sector down to the full five-digit NAICS breakouts, I could easily compare those data across those three countries because at the two through five-digit level, they are completely comparable. The agreement is that we will stay consistent at the two through five. At the six-digit NAICS code, we then start to diverge. There are some countries, um, for example, U.S. and Mexico have a specific manufacturing six-digit NAICS code for tortilla manufacturing, where Canada does not have a specific six-digit NAICS code for that activity. Those tortilla manufacturers are included in another category, in another six-digit code. So the coding system does diverge when you get beyond the five digit, but in terms of comparability of data, you can pull those data across. And when you compare those data over time, you can see the impacts of the trade agreements and the various different things that we have between our three countries in looking at the data itself. You can see how those imports or those um, products that we are bringing in um, have, have ebbed and flowed as the trade agreements have, have changed. Um, now, of course, in these economic census programs, we're talking about 2017 data, but I do want to remind you all that we actually have more timely data than the economic census, not quite as detailed in our annual programs, like county business patterns and modern employer statistics, and in our monthly and quarterly surveys, like our economic indicator surveys. Every single month, the Census Bureau publishes detailed information on imports and exports. Those data are published at the industry level by commodity and by country origination and destination, and finally, by geography, including port level data. So if you're really interested in looking at sort of the flows of commodities between our three countries, those data are available from our from our trade programs in a data tool called USA Trade Online. The tool is available to you for free. You do have to register um, and set up an account, but there is no charge. So I would really uh, recommend folks kind of comparing those data over time between our three countries, but then also using the trade data to see some of those impacts as well. So operator, do we have any questions on the phone? We do. Our first question comes from Timothy Malley. Your line is now open. How are you doing today? Good. All right. Um, I just had a quick question about um, as far as the trade agreements would go for a global economy. Is this something that I'm here for by accident today? Okay, so I, I deal with I deal with nonprofit organizations, and as far as what the turnover for the new the new fiscal year would be. My nonprofit would be looking to grow, but I've never looked into international trades or anything like that or partnerships where it came down to nonprofit organizations usually were put on the back burner. And I didn't see anything on this paperwork about the nonprofit organizations. Right. So, so let, let's talk first a little bit about nonprofits. So. At the Census Bureau, we do not publish data specifically on profit or nonprofit businesses um, for a couple of reasons, uh, but what we, what we do publish is something on tax status. So we do publish data on businesses that are subject to federal income tax or that are exempt from federal income tax. Now, tax status is a reasonable proxy for profit, nonprofit. It's not perfect. It is possible to be a for-profit business and still be tax exempt. It's kind of strange to think about that, but that is, that is actually sure. possible. Uh, but the reason why we don't publish 
profit, nonprofit is because the definition of what it means to be a profit or nonprofit business is not consistent across every state in the nation. The state rules sometimes do vary. And number two, a business can flip-flop from year to year, going from profit status to nonprofit status and maybe even back, uh, whereas that does not happen when you think about tax status. Um, so we published that. Now, in terms of nonprofits using Census Bureau data, um, of course, all of the business data we've been talking about today are for businesses that are physically located here in the United States. That information is tabulated irregardless of whether that company is owned by a foreign company, a foreign-owned company, or whether it's a domestically owned company. So the Japanese automobile manufacturers that are located here in the United States, that plant is located here, so therefore we tabulate data for it. It does not, we don't care, per se, whether or not that business is foreign-owned or not. Um, so. You can look at our data to look at the global economy from those businesses um, that are physically located here, but then the trade data then gives you a real insight into the, um, the movement of commodities in this global economy um, from the U.S. Uh, to and from other countries. So you really can get some interesting insight into you know, how much of the automobile manufacturing industry is, is here in the U.S. versus how much of the automobiles uh, that we buy on a dealer lot every every year um, come or imported. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. Um, there's there's a lot of things that we could talk about. <laughs> yes, sir. There's been a lot going on. There's been a lot of hyperboles going on here left and right and geopolitical stuff. So just trying to get the, the straightforward answer has been hard lately. And um, yeah. just trying to stay ahead of, ahead of the curve. Uh, this is the closest thing I found to being ahead of the curve, and there's just a lot of information to break down, but that did give me a lot of insight on that I'm in the right spot and just to learn a little bit more, <clears throat> especially with everything evolving right now. Like, I'm in school, and now they're about to teach us primitive stuff at this point, if you look at it. Right, right. Yeah. Well, very good. All right. Glad, glad I could help. Good. You're welcome. Our next question, I'm sorry, caller, your name was not recorded, but you queued for questions. Your line is open. Please check your mute button. Hello? Yes. Oh, hi. Yes, my name is Jude. Sorry about that. Um, so the question that I have, I'm looking at um, getting into the clean industry, uh, clean energy industry, which is it covers um, all of the areas that we were talking about today. Right. And... Um, I'm wondering, there's some companies that I've looked at, and they are in multiple sectors. Right. So they, for instance, have a refinery. They also do reclamation. Then I think they would be considered manufacturing, but maybe refinery and manufacturing is, is different. And then they also resell. So I was just wondering if you had some suggestions about which um, – sector I should look at first if yeah. I want to get that information? Yeah. So, yeah, great, great question. So, when you think about these sort of thematic industries, the green economy, the clean economy, the tourism economy, in, in nearly every one of those thematic categories, the businesses that are involved in that in that in that economy are scattered across multiple, dozens, maybe even hundreds of NAICS codes. When you think about the clean economy, clean energy, there are certainly businesses in that industry that are classified in NAICS 22, which is the utilities sector. In fact, under the NAICS uh, 22, there are specific six-digit NAICS codes for solar, geothermal, biomass, and wind electric power generation. So companies that are generating electricity with a wind farm up on the mountain ridge in California, uh, that data are published in the economic census under that NAICS 22. There are clean businesses that are in the manufacturing sector, either because they make clean energy products, they make wind turbines, let's just say, for example, or they use clean energy products. They, they have those clean energy technologies in their manufacturing process. So when they're running their actual manufacturing plant, 
they're using those clean technologies or they are sort of affiliated with those clean technologies. Uh, as you, as if you've ever driven up on the Jersey Turnpike, uh, going up through northern New Jersey, there's a very large refinery operation on one side of the highway, and adjacent to that operation is a cogeneration plant, where they take excess heat from that refinery operation and turn it into electricity. That's a clean operation because they are taking that heat that would have otherwise just been vented off into the air and are turning it, using it to boil water, to create steam, to turn a turbine, and to generate electricity. So those activities definitely are scattered across there. Um, when you just mentioned the refinery, uh, petrochemical plants and petro, uh, petroleum refineries, yes, those are both considered part of the manufacturing sector. Um, and in fact, they're in one of the categories that we were even talking about today, the, the um, petroleum and coal and, and oil uh, manufacturing. Uh, that's where refineries are classified. So yeah, they are they are scattered across across a wide variety of industries. What I would recommend you do is there are a number of organizations that have created their own definition for a lot of these sort of thematic industries. For example, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, BEA, sort of one of our children agencies at the Census Bureau, um, they have a green economy account. They have a tourism account that is published in the by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and they have a list of what are the industries that they associate with tourism, with the green economy, with clean economy. So I would Google a couple of those, and you'll see some of those industries. Um, some of those, those different categories. You will notice that the definition is not consistent. Um, I really wish it was consistent across all each of the people who have tourism data, for example. The definition is not the same, but at least you can sort of understand what are the industries that are generally thought of as being associated with that, with that field as opposed to ones that are kind of some think that they are and some think they aren't. So we don't actually, at the Census Bureau, have those, those topical sort of groupings of industries defined. Uh, we normally just refer people to those other sources. So hopefully that... that it was very helpful, yes. And stating that it's a thematic industry was also very descriptive. I appreciated that. And, and this is specifically in the oil and, and gas, but it's reclaiming the hazardous materials, reprocessing them, right. and then selling them. So those, um, do you think those would still be thematic, or would that be basically in that one um, so those, petroleum? Yeah, those businesses that, that take used motor oil, for example, and turn it back into a, a clean lubricant, they are scattered in essentially two main places. Some of them are actually in the manufacturing sector, and other ones are in the um, administrative and support and waste management and remediation services sector. It's a real mouthful, uh, NAICS 56. Um, that's the sector that some of those businesses are classified in. And so it, it really sort of depends upon what they are consuming and what they are then turning what they are consuming into. Okay, yeah, it's the HVAC type um, for once. So. Right. All right, well, thank you. And is there um, I, the, the green economy um, list is it's very helpful for the BEA. So I've been taking yeah. notes and I, I appreciate all your, your help. You're very welcome. And there are no other questions in queue. Great. Well, again, everyone, thank you all so much. Uh, Linda, were there any questions in the chat that we haven't gotten to? Um, there's one question. It's, um, is the data different from wages published on the BL from the BLS? So uh, short answer, yes. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics publishes statistics on employment and wages in a program called the Quarterly Census of Employment and Wages, QCEW. It is a fabulous data program that has really timely quarterly data on employment and wages. Um, their data are similar to the economic census employment and payroll data in that they cover employer businesses only. They do not cover self-employed people, just like we don't. 
but they are a little different, number one, in that they publish wages data, weekly, monthly, et cetera, wages, as opposed to annual payroll. So the definition of what payroll is and the definition of what is included in wages are not the same thing. Um, total annual payroll would include some types of benefits where wages typically do not include some type of paid leave and things like that. So there are, uh, there are some definitional differences. But the single biggest difference I would say when people compare the Bureau of Labor Statistics employment and wages data to the Census Bureau's employment and wages data is sometimes you will see differences in the values simply due to the classification of that business. Uh, BLS just collects data on employment and wages. And when they ask a business to report what industry they're classified in, that business chooses their own NAICS code and they assign themselves to a specific industry and that's what their data are then tabulated in. At the Census Bureau in the Economic Census, we not only collect uh, payroll and employment data, but we also collect go shipments data. We collect materials consumed data, for example, in the manufacturing sector. And very often when our analysts are reviewing the data that is, that is published or that a business has responded or reported to us, we find discrepancies. For example, there are two different NAICS codes for companies that make sweaters. If you make sweaters in a knitting mill, meaning you take yarn and you turn it into a knitted sweater, you are classified in one industry. If you buy already knit panels and all you're doing is sewing those panels together to turn it into a sweater, you're in a different NAICS industry. And sometimes when, when the business chooses our NAICS code in BLS, they may not pick the right industry. NAICS is, could be confusing at times. So when we collect the data and we have a business saying, I am a knitting mill, I make sweaters via a knitting mill, we would then check to make sure that they are reporting yarn as a material that they consume. And if we don't see any yarn that they're being consumed, the analysts would probably end up calling that company and say, hey, I think you're actually a cut and sew shop or did you just forget to report to us your yarn consumption? And so we will often change the NAICS code assigned to a business based upon our analysis of the data. That is very common, um, that misclassification is common in some industries where they, there are multiple NAICS codes for the same, what, what appears to be the same activity, um, but it's not the same activity. So we do a lot of analysis there that does sometimes result in our data being different than the, BL, than the BLS data. Uh, but in, in theory, they still measure the same types of businesses. Um, employment data um, measures the same type of employees. Uh, they don't count workers differently than how, than how we do. Um, so they, they are mostly pretty comparable for, for there. Thank you, Andy. Um, we have one more question that came in. Um, it, does the data include shipments and sales to the public sector, such as federal government? Yes, it does. So when we ask a manufacturing company to report their value of shipments from a particular plant, we don't particularly care whether that shipment is going to a regular customer or to a government customer. We just ask them to report the value of the product when it leaves the plant door. And that product could even be immediately exported, but we would still want to count those value shipments as having been manufactured here in the United States regardless of where they're going. Now to provide the type of detail that we're talking about, that this user asked about, there actually is a table in those establishment and firm size reports called uh, sales by class of customer. And in that class of customer table is where we then ask those businesses to break out their shipments into who their customer is. And there's about a dozen or so categories. They're pretty broad category, but the public sector governments is one of the, the broad categories that is broken out. Um, so if someone wanted to see how much do companies that make tanks how much do they? Sh how much of their tank shipments go to government as opposed to go to private? Uh, other other types of companies. That data would be available in the in the class of customer tables. So yeah, 
Great question. That sounds good. Thank you, Andy. Um, with that, I do not see any additional questions coming through the chat feature. Well, again, thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your busy days. If you do think of another question uh, that comes up after you're kind of browsing our data, we have included uh, Linda's email address and phone number and my email address and phone number um, on this slide. Please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. And with that, I'd like to say have a great afternoon. Thank you for your participation in today's conference. All parties may disconnect at this time.